Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for coming out. I'm Mike Cahill, your mayor. Uh, we've got a team from City Hall who are here to, to share some information with you uh, about recreational marijuana. Aaron Clausen is our city planner. Emily, oh my gosh, Emily. No, no, your last name. Emily Hutchings has been with us for a couple of years, and I just know her as Emily. Emily Hutchings, our assistant planner. Stephanie Williams, our city solicitor. Bill Burke, our city health director. Kevin Hartuni, and chief of staff in my office. Um, so I'm just going to give you a couple of things to frame the evening, and then Aaron will take you through a presentation after which we can have um, Q&A, thoughts, sentiments, whatever you want to share. Um, I do want to try to clarify for you and set the frame right away. I believe some people are here tonight uh, because you've got some strong feelings and opinions, either for or against the idea that recreational marijuana will be available for sale in Beverly. Um, so, so you understand, in 2016, during the presidential election, there was a question on the ballot statewide to make recreational marijuana legal in Massachusetts or not. And it passed statewide. In, in Beverly, it passed by about a 54 to 46 margin. And that was with a nearly 80% turnout of all registered voters in Beverly. As a result, we as a city, we your elected city officials, are obligated under that law, we must plan for, zone for, the opening of up to a certain number of recreational marijuana shops or establishments. I know some of you, I, sh I should say, I think some of you may be here to try to urge us to not let it happen. But the reality is it's passed in the law and so our job is to implement it. We have the opportunity to limit the number of establishments by vote of the city council to a number that represents 20% of the number of package stores, liquor package stores that we have in Beverly. And we have is either 19 or 20, so we, by vote of the city council, can limit the number of retail marijuana establishments to four citywide. And as I said, in a few minutes, Aaron will walk you through the zoning process that we've been kind of teeing up. We've been working on this for a number of months. Initially, we uh, went to the city council and they agreed to impose a moratorium, giving us this whole calendar year to sort through it. We need to pass what we're going to pass by the end of the calendar year uh, in preparation. So we'll, we'll walk through that in a bit. But that's, I just want you to understand that's what we're bound to do based on the results of the uh, ballot question. Also, this is an important thing to understand as well. If a community voted in favor, they need to do what we're doing. If a community voted against, then that community does not have to host any, any retail establishments. Salem voted yes, Beverly voted yes, and just for, for purposes of the nearest larger communities, Danvers voted no and Peabody voted no. What that means is once they are open and, you know, and operating, if, if somebody in Danvers or Peabody wants to go shop at a retail marijuana establishment in the area, they may well come to Beverly to do so, or they may go to Salem to do so, just to understand that, that piece of it. And, and I don't want to forget to introduce my colleagues in government who are here. Several of our city councilors are here. Uh, city Council President Paul Guancy, Ward 5 City Councilor Don Martin, at large city councilor Tim Flaherty, Ward 6 city councilor John Frades, Ward 1 city councilor David Lang. Am I missing any other elected officials? I don't think so at the moment. Can't be secret if they're in public. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's turn it over to Aaron. And as I said, once he does his presentation, we'll open it up to your thoughts and your questions. Thank you all again for being here. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, my name is Aaron Kloss, and I'm the city planner for Beverly. Um, and as the mayor pointed out uh, early on about uh, a year ago or so, the, the city council working with the administration uh, put forward a moratorium um, on recreational marijuana facilities to allow the city to develop regulations uh, to uh, regulate them through zoning and learn what the Cannabis Control Commission was going to put to together in terms of their regulations at the time. There were no state regulations. So for the past seven, eight months, if not longer, the city has put together a task force 
uh, of different departments looking at this issue. Um, as the mayor pointed out earlier, there's some of them here, Emily Hutchings from the planning department, Stephanie Williams from the solicitor's office and, and others from the solicitor's office have participated in that building, uh, building department as well as health department with Bill Burke as the director. And then finally also the, the police department represented by Chief LaLashore looking at this issue and, and figuring out how we can best regulate uh, these uses in the city of Beverly. So I'm going to provide a little background um, before I get into the zoning process and how we, we might be able to regulate or I mean, we will be able to regulate um, med uh, not medical but recreational marijuana establishments uh, through zoning. Uh, and this is just a reiteration of what the mayor uh, pointed out that um, in uh, 2016 there was a referendum on the ballot. Uh, there was a pretty de decisive vote uh, in the city of Beverly to support uh, legalization of recreational marijuana. Uh, just under 54% in support and just over 46 against. Um, actually, I should say it's just over 54 in support in Beverly. Um, statewide, it was just under 54. Uh, and there was a large turnout uh, because it was a presidential election, just under 80% um, had turned out at the time. I think, the, again, to underline the point that the mayor made earlier, the fact that the, the, the city of Beverly, the, the voters of, of Beverly supported this initiative, supported the legalization of, of recreational marijuana, the city administration is obligated to put forth zoning regulations to uh, manage that process. Um, we're not able to prohibit it. Um, that's not within our power to do so. Um, so what, uh, what are we talking about uh, when we're talking about medical, or excuse me, recreational marijuana facilities? So there's the marijuana retailer establishment. This, I think, speaks for itself, essentially an establishment that would sell um, uh, medical or marijuana uh, products to the public. Um, to consumers. There's marijuana cultivation, uh, so that is an, an entity that's licensed uh, to cultivate, process, package marijuana, and to transfer marijuana to other establish establishments, not consumers. It's basically the cultivation um, and manufacture of marijuana. There's the independent testing laboratory, and this is a laboratory licensed through the CCC. All these establishments need to be licensed through the Cannabis Control Commission, this is the state licensing board. Um, and it's financially independent uh, from the marijuana establishments uh, that I've been talking about, um, in which it, it's, it conducts tests to make sure that, uh, that the marijuana that's being sold is safe and meets uh, certain state regulations and requirements. Then there's the uh, marijuana product manufacturer. It's an entity licensed to obtain, manufacture, process, and package marijuana products and transfer those products to establishments, but not to consumers. Again, they would be uh, creating marijuana products that would go to uh, the retail establishment then that would be sold to uh, um, a consumer. And then there's the uh, marijuana research facility. This is an entity that's licensed again through the CCC um, to conduct and engage in research uh, projects that are directed by the CCC, things that are looking into the effects of, of recreational marijuana, um, how to better enforce, uh, you know, essentially manage and, and uh, promulgate updates to the regulations going forward. So some highlights of the, the state regulations. Um, the, the, in first, the, the state regulation established the Cannabis Control Commission as the regulatory body to, that would create the, the, the regulations um, for uh, marijuana establishments generally. Um, it establishes the licensing process uh, by which es establishments might uh, um, go to the state and, and receive a license to open up, uh, uh, open up shop. Um, and it creates very rigorous standards around um, things like um, security, advertising, uh, signage, um, so that there are certain requirements that are set through that licensing process. Uh, I'll get into it later, but the city also through zoning and through the host agreement has the ability to um, mirror those regulations and, 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 and codify them in a host agreement. Um, it establishes a process whereby there must be a public meeting uh, with the community prior to the licensure of that, of that um, uh, establishment. Um, and again, requires that host community agreement. So there needs to be an agreement between the city and the operator before they submit their license to the state. It also creates buffers um, within those regulations. So there's 500 foot buffers around pre-existing schools, um, uh, public and private schools, K through 12, throughout the city. Um, and it allows also communities to lessen that, that buffer uh, as well, if, if that is the choice of the community. So 
some more uh, some more highlights, um, and this is really some of the pro some of the prohibitions that are built into the regulations. Um, people are not able to consume marijuana in public places or where marijuana uh, or smoking marijuana where smoking tobacco is prohibited within the community. Um, On-site social consumption is not allowed without a vote of the voters. Um, what that means is in 2016, there was a vote uh, under referendum to actually allow and legalize recreational marijuana. There must be a similar kind of vote if there's going to be a license for on-site consumption. Um, basically, you go to a, a, a facility and, and consume on-site. You can't do that right now. It does not allow delivery of marijuana products to a consumer directly, so you can't have home delivery. It's not allowed under the state regulations. Um, open containers of marijuana uh, are not allowed in, in motor vehicles similar to alcohol. Um, you know, if you, a package can't be opened and on the, set, and it's on the seat next to you uh, while you're operating a vehicle. Um, and then uh, furnishing marijuana to persons under age of 21, again, similar to alcohol, is not allowed. Um, we've provided this link. The, the regulations are, are rather lengthy. Um, I, I glossed over the security requirements and some of the the, uh, the requirements of, of, of related to employment, um, how they're uh, certified, how th they go through a, back, a rigorous background check. Um, if you're really interested in the detail of that, um, I encourage you to check out this webpage. Um, and we'll also make this uh, presentation available on our city webpage so you can link to it directly. So how can Beverly respond? How can we develop uh, zoning regulations to uh, adopt uh, for the city to, to manage and make sure that uh, marijuana establishments uh, operate safely um, and mitigate any public nuisance or hazard? Um, we're able to promulgate zoning regulations that regulate time, place, and manner of, of how those facilities operate. And that gets into things like, um, you know, what is the what, who's, who's employed, what kind of background checks of the employees, what are the operations um, of the facility, whether it's retail or a uh, manufacturing facility. We can get into the detail of that through a special process with, uh, with uh, a zoning board. We can limit the number of retailers, as the mayor said early on, to 20% of the, the uh, package store liquor license. In, in, in Beverly, that essentially means that we can limit it to four total uh, throughout the city. We can impose a local sales tax, uh, uh, 3% on all retail sales. This applies only to the retail stores. Uh, this, is, this would require city council action, but it's something that we could add on as a community um, to help mitigate um, any of the, the, um, the impacts and the resources required to uh, support uh, these kinds of uh, uses. Um, and then we can, we can create uh, regulations that reasonably restrict the cultivation, processing, and manufacturing um, so that we mitigate the public nuisance of those of those kinds of facilities like odor, traffic, uh, ensuring security um, through a, a very uh, tight security plan. Those are the kinds of things that we can build into zoning. So. Jumping back into uh, the host agreement, we'll get, we'll get a little bit more into the zoning requirements. Um, the, as I said earlier, the uh, Cannabis Control Commission created in the regulations requirement that there's a host community agreement um, that's negotiated between the community and the operator of that facility. Um, so that needs to be uh, signed and, and agreed to prior to license application with the state. Um, the city is able to um, uh, charge a, a reasonable impact fee on those kinds of, on the impacts of that facility um, up to 3% of gross sales and that's for all the uses that's so before I was talking about a sales tax that's related to only retail establishments um, the impact fee goes to all of the um, uh, marijuana establishments and on the gross sales up to 3% and that's to go to deal with the impacts of that particular loose use uh, things like additional needs for public safety um, enforcement, uh, traffic impacts, um, and that sort of thing. Um, the one other final point on that is that the, the term of the uh, host uh, community agreement is for five years. Um, the city can uh, work with the proponent to ensure that there are certain other elements built into that host agreement, like operational standards. There's a lot of redundancy 
in which you're here tonight. There are high standards in the licensing process. There are standards that we can set that, that mirror that in the local zoning process. And then in, that can also be built into a host community agreement. Uh, again, it gets, that gets to things like security, um, waste management, uh, time, uh, time of operation. That can be codified in, in, the, in the host community agreement. So the moratorium was adopted December 31 of 2018 um, with the understanding that the city would be working internally and then also uh, with, the, with the community to develop regulations that could be adopted by the end of this year. Um, I should say that our new ordinance should be adopted by December 31st, 2018. So we have several, uh, about three to four months uh, to work on this. Um, zoning requirements need to be adopted to reasonably regulate marijuana establishments. If we don't adopt zoning regulations, um, they, we basically are forced to regulate them under our current zoning re regulations. So for example, um, unless we adopt specific re regulations towards uh, marijuana establishments, a retail establishment could come in and would be considered retail under our current zoning, which would allow it in many different zoning districts that we may not feel as a community is appropriate for that particular use. So. What we want to put forward is a zoning amendment that addresses that particular issue and making sure that these specific establishments that I mentioned earlier are regulated correctly, located in a correct zone, and have the certain uh, requirements, whether, whether or not they be dimensional or performance-based, to, to mitigate any, any nuisance impacts or negative impacts on the community. Um, and we're, as I noted earlier, we're, we've been working for a while to understand what, are the, what we need to consider in terms of uh, zoning regulations based on uh, the CCC regulations, and then also based on uh, research and, and experiences from other states. As you know very well, other states have, have legalized recreational marijuana as well. And we've done a lot of research in, to understand what kind of zoning was implemented in those places, how, in what context, and what were the effects, and how can we, um, how can we learn from that. So we've been doing a lot of that research and, and drafting the, those zoning re regulations um, that we'll be putting forward in the relatively near future. So what are the, what are the basic elements that we're considering as we build uh, the zoning ordinance, or the zoning regulations, um, and other ordinance, uh, ordinances that we can adopt as a community? So the first one we've been, you've heard about three or four times already, we're considering the, the restriction, the total, total number of retail establishments that would be allowed in the city to, um, 20%, again, that means that would, there would be the uh, ability for four retail establishments in the city. We're looking at adopting a zoning ordinance that would consider buffers um, between marijuana establishments uh, for the following uses. You see there bulleted, there's the schools K through 12. This exists within the, the CCC regulations. We would mirror that. Uh, looking at a buffer for public parks and playgrounds, uh, public library, libraries, and then we're also looking at licensed child care facilities, which would include daycare centers, preschools, and after school facilities. These are um, licensed at the state level so that we have a, a document, uh, document and documentation of them. Um, the buffers would be for facilities that are in existence at the time, pre-existing facilities. Um, and we're looking at a range of buffers, so 500 feet um, from the parcel boundary to, of that particular use to the uh, marijuana establishment. Uh, for K through 12, um, and we're looking to pot potentially reduce that for other kinds of uh, facilities like parks and playgrounds uh, to ensure that um, we're, we're not zoning out the use. We're not able to do that. I'll get to that in just a moment. Um, then we're also looking at regulations that can prevent the concentration of all the, ma the ma uh, marijuana retailers in one place. We don't want a concentration. We don't want a geographic area where all four of those retailers are operating. There's an, it's inequitable uh, distribution for that kind of use, and we don't want uh, any of the, the, those negative externalities to build into some sort of negative impact on a particular neighborhood, um, basically shouldering one neighborhood with, with all the, the negative effects of that. So we're looking at ways that we can make sure that uh, concentration or concentrations are averted, whether it's, buffer, whether it's through a buffer between uh, those uses or whether it's through special permit criteria, uh, which a board can apply and consider when they review a spe special permit application. Um, and then we're also looking at adopting the local tax of 3% on all retail sales. So those are the things that we're looking at building into the zoning um, right now. Oops. And I mentioned just briefly that we're unable to zone 
eff effectively out a particular use. So as the mayor pointed out and I've said, because the city adopted and um, voted in support of legalizing recreational marijuana, um, we have to create zoning and we have to create zoning that doesn't effectively zone it out, meaning we select a zone and a buffer dynamic that essentially disallows that use. Um, we have to make sure that we're, we're fairly creating regulations that will allow that use to uh, be established within the city. And so those are many of the things that we keep in our mind as we think about buffers uh, between a medical or a marijuana use and a particular uh, use like a school and also the buffers between the, those uses. So I'll talk a little bit. What you're looking at here is the, the zoning district map for the city. This is, this is current. Um, some of the... Some of the met, uh, marijuana uses that we're considering and where to locate them by special permit of the Zoning Board of Appeals are as follows. I'll kind of highlight them for you. So we're looking at cultivation and manufacturing as essentially a manufacturing and agricultural use, more of, more of a manu manufacturing use, and would allow those by special permit in what is called the General Industrial or the um, Office R&D in Light Industrial uh, park and these are generally located in, by the airport. So this is an IR district up here. I'll pull this off so you can hear me. There we go. Here we go. This is the airport right there. That's an IR district over here off of 128. This this is 128 cutting through the city of Beverly. This area right here is an IR district, which would we're considering allowing manufacturing cultivation here by special permit. And then the IAG district is General Industrial, which is coming center, running down Park Street and the Bass River. It's our historically General Industrial area where you see your heavier industrial uses and would be a, a place where, that, where a, a manufacturer or cultivator would make sense. It would, would, would have lesser of an impact on its surrounding users. And then we're considering um, retail establishments in general commercial, which is these kind of more purple areas. This is LA Street right here, 62 coming in from Danvers. The Stop and Shop, that's a general commercial. Shaw's up off of 128, and then the Stop and Shop Plaza up on Enon. And then also allowing retail establishments in the CC District, which is the, the Central Business District, um, again by special permit. And considering all the buffers that would have an effect on where that location or where that establishment could be located. And I'll just give you an example of, of how that might play out. So uh, Ayers Rail Side is right here. This is the, the school. So there would be a buffer of 500 feet um, that an establishment could not be located within that buffer. Um, there's a number of child care centers. Um, and it, I mentioned library. I'll point that out too. The library located right here downtown, um, right off Dane Street. Uh, there would be, uh, as we're considering now, a buffer so that um, in the CC district, although it's allowed by special permit, if it's w within that buffer distance, it would not be allowed under zoning. So those, those are some of the considerations we're, 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 we're looking at as we develop um, the regulations themselves um, and thinking about where the, the appropriate location is, what the uh, appropriate buffer is, and how to mitigate concentrations of the retail use. So next steps, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. I want to give everybody a chance to ask questions. So this outlines the general planning process or the zoning amendment process. Um, we do a lot of research. Uh, the planning department, uh, with a participation of other city departments and the public, do a lot of research to develop a draft ordinance. Um, we would file that, that ordinance with the city council. Um, at this point, we'd be looking to meet that deadline of December uh, of 2018, we'd be looking to submit an ordinance to the City Council um, in the middle of October to begin that process with the public hearing being scheduled in November. So the ordinance gets referred to the Planning Board, um, where the City Council and the Planning Board schedule a joint public hearing to be held in uh, likely, in given our time frame, early November, um, where there's an opportunity to really look at, uh, look at the proposed zoning and the community has an uh, opportunity there to provide comment on it as well. Following the joint public hearing, uh, the, the planning board usually convenes and holds their own meeting where they'll make a recommendation on that, on that zoning ordinance that goes to the city council. The city council then votes. It needs to pass two-thirds. It's a, it's a supermajority vote for it to pass. 
And if the city council uh, votes to pass and adopt the ordinance, the mayor then can sign it. Um, and then it becomes a uh, law, and then we would implement it. So that's, that's the general process. In terms of timeline, again, we're, we're here at the middle of September. We're looking to submit um, an ordinance to the city council for consideration mid-October um, with a public hearing sometime in November with an ordinance by the end of December. So that's it. Um, there's a lot of information I just threw at you, so I would like to open it up for public comment and maybe give the mayor a, an opportunity to, to add any uh, final comments before we break out to Q&A. Sure. Th <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Claussen. Uh, just a couple of things to maybe further clarify. <clears throat> Mr. Claussen was pointing out where we are thinking of zoning to allow the, the grow and manufacturing facilities. Just so you understand, there will be no retail component in those facilities those would be a typical manufacturing type of building. And in fact, under the state statute, there are, there are very stringent security requirements for that type of operation, just so you, you know, and, and we can give you more detail on that, but <clears throat> the, the point with those is that, um, that the, the security be such that, you know, you don't have to worry about anybody going in there who doesn't belong there. Um, and they would be, you know, they, they're, they're in a lot of communities already under the Medical Marijuana Act, the medical marijuana um, growing facilities, and, and they've been a real economic uh, plus in those communities. Um, oh, the other thing I want to make sure I, I do is acknowledge uh, City Councilor Scott Hausman from Ward 4, who came in right after I turned the microphone over to Mr. Clausen. Thank you for being with us, Councilor. Um, so, who would like to share a thought or a question? Thank you very much. Um, my question relates to, to timing. So you went through the process, and to the extent that regulations are adopted and become law by December 31st, what is reasonably the earliest date that a retail establishment could open, assuming that all of their paperwork was in order and they followed the process appropriately? So there's a lengthy process um, that a, an establishment has to go through with the state and then locally. So as soon as that ordinance is adopted, and say it's December 31st, and we start the new year, um, they could submit an application uh, to, in, as, as, as it is now, uh, we, we would uh, view the Zoning Board of Appeals as the granting authority in that situation. Um, a special permit process can last anywhere from 90 days to 120 days, if not longer, depending on the complexity of that use. I think it's fair to say, given that this is our first this will be our first uh, time uh, dealing with this particular use and the unique, uh, uniqueness of it and the fact that there aren't many communities in the Commonwealth that have gone through this process either that it's going to be in the longer end of that. So there's a special permit process that has to happen. There has to be a, a process whereby a host agreement is agreed upon between the city and the applicant or the proponent. Um, and then that host agreement has to be codified before, they, before the uh, proponent can submit their license application to the state. I'm not familiar with the timeline of licensing with the state, but um, it seems to me that it can be lengthy. And, and what, I, what I can say about that is the, the detail that they look for and the security measures, the background checks for, of, um, for employees, um, the, the, the kinds of detail they're looking for in operations, um, it, it's, a, it's a fairly lengthy process. So it could, be, you know, it could be a good six months to a year before something's in, in line. This is j just meant to, to form a basis of comparison. I apologize if it comes across as snarky. I don't mean it that way. But during the fourth quarter of this last year, the United States Congress passed an overhaul to our entire tax code that was effective within 60 days. Why is it that it's going to take almost three years from the date that this was passed by the citizens of the Commonwealth until we get the first retail establishments? That just seems a bit extreme. So the first year, you're right, almost two years. The first two years has been, you know, taken up in the, the what is it called, the Cannabis Control Commission uh, doing their work. And then um, in working through their process and working with communities who were looking for some clarity, uh, allowing for that moratorium period up to the end of this calendar year. So there we are at two years. And you know, the process that Mr. Clausen outlined, as he said, could take several months. So there, you, there we are well into a third year. Follow up on that. Part of the reason we had the moratorium was when we started, when we established the moratorium with, with the support of the city council, 
there were no regulations. There was no guidelines for how communities should approach these kinds of establishments. And so we had to wait to really understand how the state was going to approach it through the CCC before we could even consider how we would formulate the zoning regulations. Thank you. Um, I just uh, returned from Colorado for a week uh, consult with um, uh, shop owners and um, a, uh, a consulting firm. And um, the one question I have that, that they all kept bringing up when, I, when we said we were from Massachusetts was, is your, host, is your ACA, your host agreement, going to have stipulations on local ownership? Or is it basically going to be um, whatever licenses that you accept as far as out of town, out of state, out of country um, investors that are coming in and wanting to open shops in Massachusetts? Um, and would it, would it be conducive to the city to have local ownership for these establishments? That's a good question. I, you know, we haven't um, had a chance to dig into what um, the depth of discretion we have in developing the host agreements in terms of ownership. It's a very good question. We'll have to, I'll have to get back to you on that one. What I do know is that there are some host agreements that stipulate um, employees coming from the community for which the, the, the facility is located. Um, so you can certainly require that the, the establishment hire uh, people from within the city. Whether or not you can stipulate its local ownership, I don't know, and we can look into that a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, so we're, uh, quick question about four uh, licenses. Those are four licenses for retail establishments, so that does not, in other words, it can't be three growers and one retailer, is that correct? That's correct, it's four retail establishments. Thank you. Um, I, I had a, a real quick question with regard to, again, the number of licenses uh, for retailers. Um, you said that uh, the, the city of Beverly has the ability to restrict that number to 20% of all available liquor licenses. Um, is that just either it's 20% or it's, uh, you know, the number of licenses that is the same as package stores? Or is it, you know, could it be anything in between? Um, and then, uh, that's kind of a quick one. Um, so, my other one. Sure. So, so if we were not to move with the city council to, to restrict the number of retail establishments to 20% of package store licenses, what's possible? No limit. So I, okay. I can tell you that at this point in time, it's my intention that we will petition the city council to limit it to 20% of, um, of package store licenses. So our goal is to limit the number of retail establishments to four. Okay. Um. All right, Pete Johnson from 677 Hale Street. Um, first, uh, an observation, something to look at. I thought I saw in the Salem News today an article about um, Limit, despite meeting the other requirements, I don't know what city this was, but it was North Shore, um, that a, I think it was a proposed license met the requirements, but the licensing agency was considering not allowing it because it would have been in the same mall, mini mall, as a game shop, a gym, and something else, would have, which would have had a high proportion of young, younger people. And then I've got a question. So that gets to the special permit criteria that can be established um, and guides the, the Zoning Board of Appeals in making their decision. Um, whether or not that's, that's actually, you know, how legal that decision is, uh, is, um, um, and I, don't, I can't answer that. I would say it would be, in my, in my opinion, I think it would be difficult to create special permit criteria that said if you had retailers in, in a mini mall that uh, cater to a younger demographic that you would have a basis to, um, disallow or prohibit a retail shop, my guess is that's something that would, wouldn't stand the test. I thought the same, but something to think about anyway. Yeah, it's, fair, it's a fair and question. And the other the question is to the gentleman's question over here. I also thought I had read several weeks ago about although the, the, um, the tax can be 3%, communities imposing fees, which are in mitigation of implementation and blah, 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 which can be set at a level 
that only a well-financed, and in this context is presented naturally as an out-of-town or out-of-country high roller can come in and scoop up the licenses because they're the only ones that can afford it. Is that, um, do you know whether that <clears throat> is a fact that you can limit, you can have fees as well as taxes or is that play into this situation? Yeah, so as I, as I mentioned, in, uh, there's, there's the opportunity for the city through a vote of the city council to levy a 3% sales tax on retail establishments. So there's that opportunity uh, over and above what the state sales tax is. Uh, then there's an uh, impact fee that the city can impose through a host community agreement up to 3% of gross sales for all establishments. But it's based on sales, so that's proportional to sales. I think it's, I think it's pretty understandable and understood that an organization that's going to proceed um, and open up one of these establishments is going to be well-funded. Um, you think about the kinds of security that's going to need to be put into place, the kind of the, the background, the work, the, the soft cost to go into uh, getting a license to getting approval. I think it's fair to say, and this is, this is my opinion, but it's fair to say that it's going to be a well-capitalized organization, whether it's local or not. There are local organizations that could handle that, for sure. Hi, I'm, I'm one part of the 46% that voted against this referendum. I think in particular it's a really bad message. It's, uh, it's a big mistake. I understand we live in a democracy, and, and the majority voted for it. Um, two questions. I read, I believe, that there is a possibility of doing a referendum within Beverly to overturn this. Is that true? Thank you for the question. Let me walk you through possibilities. But first, I want to, I want to recognize uh, Mr. a few minutes ago, uh, Ward 2 City Councilor Estelle Rand, who joined us a little while ago. Thanks for being here, Councilor. Uh, so there is a uh, citizen referendum opportunity whereby, and, you know, Beverly residents can gather signatures to put a question on the ballot as to whether to uphold this or repeal it. So there is that opportunity. Um, that could be done in a scheduled election or as a special election. I think we, can, we can get into more details. Uh, there's another alternative beyond that that I'm going to let the solicitor explain because I don't want to explain it wrong. So there's that, that opportunity for citizen petition and one other. So um, either way, it, re it would require a vote of the voters. It requires a ballot question. There are just two different ways to get to the ballot. One is what Mayor referred to, which is set forth in the city charter. Um, and it has to be initiated by citizens. The second way is under state law, um, and there is some reference to this type of thing, although not specific to marijuana in our city charter, where the city council um, can pass a measure um, ordering something, uh, a question to the ballot with the approval of the mayor. Uh, so those are the two avenues, but no matter what, it requires a vote of the voters. I mean, I would encourage the city council to do so, to let people have a second chance at it. I think in particular, if people knew if the question was that by passing this, it means that at least four marijuana shops for recreational marijuana are going to open in Beverly as a result of this, the vote very well could have been different. My second question is about federal law. You know, you've said repeatedly, I understand that it's the state law, it's, it passed a referendum, However, the federal law still prohibits the use of recreational marijuana. So we're obeying state law and we're defying federal law. How does that work? <laughs> you know, I, I, I am an attorney, but I just get the city in trouble if I don't hand it over to the solicitor. Here you go. So the reality, you are correct. Um, and the reality is it is now legalized in Massachusetts and we as a municipality have an obligation to zone for it properly. Um, so it's, the, it's not the municipality itself that has made it legal. Um, we, we as a municipality need to responsibly plan for where these establishments are, are going to be cited. Um, it, I understand the question. Um, Well, in, in, in the country where it, it is legalized, it's legal under state law, so. 
And I just want to put a point, fine point on, on uh, Solicitor Williams' comment there. As I said earlier, if we don't adopt regulations specifically regulating marijuana facilities, we're abdicating our ability to actually regulate them at all uh, outside of what's required under state regulations. So if we don't do anything, it, we're shooting ourselves in the foot, frankly, on, on how we can manage this use and how it's uh, adopted under the legalization in the state of Massachusetts, Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I'm a free market guy, and my question is if the Beverly market could support not four, but six, eight, or ten retail establishments, why would it be in the interest of the residents of Beverly to limit it to four, given that you'd probably have to have four Cappy-style superstores to meet the demand of the market, which concentrates large amounts of product in one location and serves as a a bigger target for someone who may want to violate the security of, of those areas. It seems to me, I'd like to know what the advantage is to, to residents. And finally, a comment. Uh, if we're going to have another referendum on whether uh, we should allow uh, retail establishments uh, to come on board, given the fact that we've had one, if that fails, can we have a third and a fourth and a fifth? I think I'll, an I'll answer the second question first. There is a process by which people can gather signatures and put something on the ballot, and there's no limit on how many times that can happen, right? Our charter is silent on that matter, so I would say, you know, it sounds like yes. Um, as far as the, the, the limit on the number, uh, my sense is that, you know, what, what, what we're looking at with this uh, passage of is really a cultural move and shift, right? We have to approve a measure limiting the number of retail establishments to four. It may be that in a couple of years' time, a few years' time, there's, there's a whole different level of comfort than there is now. Um, there's, you know, it is important to recognize and, and, and understand and acknowledge that the presidential election is when the most voters come out every four years. Of all the different elections we have, it's always the highest turnout. And so we have margin at nearly an 80% turnout in favor of legalizing recreational marijuana, which is why we're here tonight. Uh, how many signatures would it take on the referendum to overturn? Um, Emily, would you start moving back up this way? There are a few people up here waiting a turn. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, there is a detailed process set forth in the city charter, but initially it's 10% of the registered voters at the last municipal election. And according to the city clerk, at the last municipal election, there were 26,100 registered voters. So that would be just over 2,600 signatures that um, uh, somebody would need to collect in order to initiate the petition process. Um, at that point in time, it would go to the city council for consideration of the question of whether or not it would go onto the ballot. If the council approved it, it would go to the ballot. If it did not approve it, then the folks collecting the signatures would, ha would have the opportunity to collect another 5% signatures. And if they collect 15% of um, the number of registered voters in the last municipal election, it would then um, go to the ballot as a special election probably at this stage. Um, if there were a, a regular election within the next 120 days, then it could go to the ballot um, at that election. But that's a general overview of the um, citizen initiative process. And I also just m add um, to that, even if, uh, Beverly were to, uh, through um, a vote of the voters, um, ban the siting of a marijuana establishments, um, personal use would still be legal. So to sort of loop back to the, the question about federal law versus state law, um, state law still allows personal use in communities where marijuana establishments are banned. Uh, so really, you know, as a municipality, what we're doing is just creating regulation for where these stores are going to go um, that are in the marijuana business, essentially. 
Yes, I had another question. <clears throat> is the law enforcement in the medical community going to be monitoring um, this, these stores on a, on a regular basis? Monitoring? You mean the way they do other stores? The like way they the, do our like they monitor stores. liquor stores, not selling to uh, minors uh, oh, oh, whatever, I hear or whatever. Um, it, it's kind of a question about the ABCC. Who, who would be the authority? So, yeah. so uh, I believe under the CCC regulations, they are going to have, I can't remember the term, but sh shoppers that go in there undercover to, what is it? Just like private shoppers. Secret shoppers, thank you, the, our uh, health director smoking regulations yes secret shopper program that will be um w that will be run through the ccc so that will be in effect and as as far as security goes uh, i'm sorry oh as far as security goes uh it, the the industry is going to be very heavily regulated um for starters, for retail shops, when somebody enters the store, my understanding is they're going to be required to show an ID when they enter the shop. Um, all the product is going to be locked. Um, it's not going to be visible by the public if you walk by the store. Um, even employees who are running the cash register may not even have access to the back room. There are inventory checks every day. Everything has to be reconciled. There are diversion prevention programs. Um, so, so, you know, I understand it is sort of a brave new world, but, but the, the security that is already built into the licensing process, from what I can tell, seems very, very stringent. They're required to submit a security plan. There has to be video surveillance, um, lighting on the perimeter, panic buttons, um, silent alarms to the police station. So, uh, so it has been, you know, there, there are regulations in place, and uh, we have been working with the police chief in formulating these, um, the zoning regulations, and I expect that he and um, his officers will continue to be part of the conversation. One, one thing to do as, as, an, as an individual citizen may be to, to look to the record um, around medical marijuana dispensaries in the state thus far. And to, to see what type, you know, and, and, and I, I haven't heard much, uh, you know, in terms of concerns of security within those uh, dispensaries, but that's something we can all look to. And I'm sure that the commission has been looking to as well as they move forward with this. Sir. Yes, I, Stephanie answered a lot of the security questions I had, but another would be, would the city be able to um, create an ordinance for the retail and cultivation facilities that require them to add additional layers of security at their establishments on top of what already exists? I certainly think we have that authority. Um, I, th I think, and Aaron, you may have comments regarding this as well. Uh, the, the state regulations are quite comprehensive. I think we're open to suggestions if, if we see that there may be a gap in, in the regulations. So that is something that I think is being reviewed as we look at performance standards for a special permit. Exactly. Just a kind of an example. I think what we can build is in the criterion or the criteria for the, the decision making process uh, that the situation that was offered earlier about that mini mall with retail shops that, that uh, serve a, a younger demographic, there could be a security plan that needs to be submitted, um, an operational plan that adjusts um, over and above what the, the basic regulations considering its context. So there's that, there is the ability, um, that discretionary ability through the special permit process to add on to that to make sure that the, the additional safeguards uh, that are necessary are there. And they have to be reasonable in their application, but it's something that we could put into the special permit process. Uh, just a question again about the referendum. Are you aware of any uh, current citizens' efforts to get a referendum on the ballot? And uh, can somebody from the city council comment on their consideration of such a referendum? I'm not aware of any. So here in Beverly, we, we know of nothing yet. And in any other communities, are we we're not, not aware? We're not aware of any other communities. Um, last, year when we, last year when we were passing the moratorium, there were a few individuals that I was aware of in the community who seemed to be making inquiries about the process, but evidently made a decision not to go forward with it. So your question is, is the city council interested in proactively
putting forward something to be on the ballot. Uh, I'm not looking to put there, but you've got a group of individuals who haven't as a body met to discuss this yet. Um, what I would say, what, what I would say, and then if any of them want to speak, obviously welcome to, what I would say is what I said earlier, we as elected officials need to be mindful of, of the input of all of our uh, constituents, including the result of the vote with such a significant turnout and, you know, and com coming back with the results that it did. Add anything? As I said, you folks haven't had a chance to discuss this as a body in any way. Is that enough for an hour? Well, before I say anything, I would defer to the city solicitor. If we say anything, whereas we're, we have a majority here, is that a violation of the open meeting law? I, I think that's a, a good observation, Mr. President, and you may want to refrain from that at this point in time because it's, it hasn't been noticed. I mean, you're here to take in information, really, so I think that's probably a wise decision. I will add that I am not aware of any other community in which the voters voted yes in which the legislative body, the city council, um, or the select board then made a decision through their legislative process to put it back on the ballot. So um, I think that's sort of a good litmus test and um, kind of underscores the mayor, mayor's point about the 80% of the people who did turn out and vote 54%. But just briefly, I'll say that I have been approached by a couple of people that uh, voted against this to, would like to see it as a referendum on a ballot. So if I could, just so, so everybody understands and anybody who was, watches this on BevCam understands what just transpired, there are currently, I think, seven city councilors here out of nine. That constitutes a quorum. So it wasn't, this meeting was not noticed as a public meeting of the city council. So really, they, if, were they to say anything substantive in response to your question, they'd be violating the open meeting, meeting law. I know any and all of them are, are happy to talk with any of you after the meeting and, and beyond tonight. Right? Thank you, everyone. Um, first of all, thank you for the research that went into tonight's presentation. Uh, I have a review question. You talked about the zoning, I think it was buffers with the schools and childcare facilities. Was that 500 feet, is that what you said? And Look, then it- uh, Hang on just a second, man. We'll, get, we'll yep. let you keep the microphone. One thing I meant to say before, uh, when we do present a proposed uh, zoning ordinance to the city council, which we're targeting for the second October meeting, um, once we do that, we will make public, we will put up in city hall the maps that would go along with the proposal that would overlay buffers to the, to the zones that we're talking about. So you could come into City Hall and give those a look in the couple weeks intervening between then and the public hearing. We'll also uh, put them up on the city website. So when the time comes that there's something concrete for the council to begin to consider, we'll try to make that as easy for you to see and, and digest as possible. And let me give the microphone to, to Mr. Claussen to answer the rest of your question. So right now what we're considering is a 500-foot buffer uh, from the schools, uh, K through 12, um, and child care facilities. Right. The, the regulations do allow a community to reduce that um, if, it, if it's considered a, a good thing, uh, but we're just looking at the 500-foot buffer at this point. Um, when, when just to follow up on Mayor's point about making more information available, please sign in and provide your contact information, at least email. Once we have uh, or an ordinance available, we can email it out to you directly. Um, so please uh, do that so we can uh, forward that information to you. So I, I think the 500, keeping the max is great. And then I think you said there is also a buffer for parks and playgrounds, but that hadn't been decided yet. Is that right? Yeah, we're, we're considering a number um, that, that we've, we've looked at both 500 and 300 feet uh, from the mm -hmm. parks and playgrounds. Uh, again, one of the things we really need to be cognizant of is establishing a framework whereby we, it looks like we're allowing a particular use, but because of the buffer system, we're essentially zoning it out of, of the community. So we want to be cognizant of that and, and making sure that um, we do allow for particular locations um, and, and particular organizations that are deemed to be well suited for the community, meaning they, they have their, their act together in terms of security, in terms of operation, so that we can be comfortable with that business in the city. Well, I would just comment that those are very open places, parks and playgrounds, so I think uh, 
maximum buffer is a good idea. Yeah, understood. We have uh, the retail liquor, liquor stores in the city of Beverly. They follow some of the same rules as this marijuana, the re retail marijuana stores may follow. Can some of these liquor retail stores request these licenses also because they basically fall in the same laws and it may be a little easier to establish? That's my first question. It's a great question. It's one of the first ones we had. You know, if, if, if somebody is well equipped uh, to deal with um, retail product that is only available and legal to people over 21, might it make sense to put them, you know, to, to allow for them to do both? The law doesn't allow it. The, it's the statute that doesn't allow it, or it's the CCC regulations, or both. Yeah. So uh, the CCC regulations um, speak to not um, or, or prohibiting the sale of um, alcohol that has um, cannabis in it. So, but the business models that we're seeing um, going through the licensing process are exclusively for a marijuana product. So thus far, there's no indication that the CCC has any interest in licensing any kind of business that is selling anything else, especially alcohol. Um, it's very heavily regulated, even situations in which a company is running um, a registered medical marijuana um, dispensary has to be completely separated. They could have a recreational one and then they can also have next door medical one and they have to have separate entrances, completely separate processes for doing all their reconciliation, um, for you know, identif give, requiring personal identification. So given that that's a requirement with respect to medical marijuana, I, I think it's very unlikely that we'll be seeing any time soon um, package stores being able to sell marijuana establishments. But that's really something with, that's within the purview of the CCC. Okay, the other question is, we have a mobile ice cream truck. What about mobile marijuana trucks? If they get licensed, will they be allowed to come to the city of Beverly? No. How many signatures do I need to get to secede from the union? <laughs> That's just a joke. Uh, my name is Brian Anderson. I was a sergeant in the United States Marine Corps for 10 years, retired. I've been in this business now for 12 years. And the level of inaccuracies and people who absolutely have no idea what they're talking about I mean, the fact that we keep saying marijuana, marijuana, it's not marijuana, it's cannabis. Marijuana is a slang term. We don't use hooch and booze when we're talking about alcohol. So I don't understand how, how, why we can't get around that. Um, I just want to express my opinion coming from the veteran side of things. Uh, I was wounded in the Marine Corps and CBD and THC got me off opiate pain medication. I started a project that's gotten more veterans off of opioids, antipsychotics, and benzodiazepines than, I lost 13 Marines in combat at a platoon level. I've lost 27 to overdose and suicide. Every single one of them were on one of those, antidepressant, antipsychotic, opioid. So when I hear people sitting here talking about how this is a dangerous drug and we need to stay away from it. Everything the DEA said from 19, well, before they were the DEA, when they were the narcotics uh, agency, they have already admitted they lied about it. And it's been taken, it took till 2018 for them to take it down. And yet we still have people that show up and reference these studies as, you know, real things. So I think a lot more research needs to be done by the city, the state, and it's absurd that we voted for it two years ago, and here we are two years later, and nothing has been done of any substance. Thank, thank you, Brian. Thanks, I've got uh, two quick comments. So um, my name is Adam Posick, I live on, on 
Hale Street, just a couple of blocks off of Cabot. Um, but I'm in the financial services industry, and so I've had occasion to speak with a number of, of folks in states that have, have gone down this path a long time ago, primarily around questions about involving um, retail proceeds and the banking system and, and things of that nature. But through those conversations, anecdotally what I've been told by those retailers is that in locales where either the tax rates or the fees have slowly crept up or the city councils have made it effectively, I won't say impossible, but very difficult for these retailers to, to conduct their business. What has happened is despite the fact that there is a, um, a, a regime in place for retail establishments, there's still an incredibly thriving black market because it's just been made too difficult for the businesses to operate at a reasonable profit margin without drastically increasing their fees or it's become too difficult for the citizens of those areas to effectively access the retailers. And so I would really encourage the city council as you go through this process to think about that. Because as was mentioned, regardless of what any one or two or even 2,300 for you know, the signatures uh, might feel, the fact of the matter is that it has been legalized in this commonwealth. And if we don't provide for an effective retail uh, establishment, we're going to have a black market in marijuana in the city. Whether we want it or not, it's going to happen if we don't make this effectively available to the citizens. Um, my second comment is more of, a, I guess, a cultural comment. And that is that, that if you look back in, in recent decades, um, California, New York, Massachusetts have typically led cultural change. And change is difficult, no matter what area that we, that we look at. And in this area, I really would hate to see Beverly be part of a, a, a decision to rather than lead this cultural change and be a part of ensuring that it, that it roll out in any proper uh, way, that we would dig in our heels and say, get off my lawn, because we don't want change here. That's not what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is about, and I would hope that that's not what the city of Beverly is about. Thank you. I don't mean to ignore you, Mr. Mayor, but I have questions for Mr. Clausen and the city I'll solicitor. No, I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> and I have a bunch of questions. Um, first, you talked, Mr. Clausen, about establishing buffer zones in schools and that the law allowed that, if a community so wished. Um, what counts as a school? Briscoe was our middle school, but now it's Beverly Middle School, and it's in a different geographic location? Sure, Does sure. Briscoe count as a school? Or so no? if it was still a school, um, it would count, yeah. So a K through 12 schools, public or private, um, would be a school that a buffer would be drawn around. And it's drawn at the parcel boundary. Okay, thank you. Not, so not Briscoe it's because it's property. not a school anymore. Okay. Right. Um, and then on the impact fee, you talked about that. And you said it was based on gross sales, and there was a limit. Um, if gross sales in year one are X, but they grow in year two and three and four, do, what limit is set? The year one gross sales or the year three gross sales? It's, it's an annual, it's an annual uh, assessment. So, oh, it's uh, an annual sale. Yep. Thank you. Um, and, and let me just point out that the host agreement where that impact fee is established is a five-year term. So they can change over time, but it's established in that, that host agreement. Okay, all right. Um, and then who uh, is considering these zoning regulations? How, how do they get to the council? So I, through the planning department, as the planning director would submit um, a proposed zoning amendment for the council to consider. Uh, they would refer it to the planning board and then, as I said, schedule a joint public hearing with the city council and public and the planning board. So it's my department working with other departments in drafting those regulations, but submit it to the council for consideration. Okay, thank you. Um, and um, the solicitor might know this. If um, the city doesn't establish a buffer or is silent, on a buffer, what happens? So under state law, there is uh, already a 500 foot buffer. Um, 
from pre-existing public or private K through 12 schools. Uh, we, if we do nothing, that will remain in place. So the city has the option of reducing the buffer and uh, although the statute doesn't explicitly state that uh, we have this authority, other communities are approving buffers around other establishments um, beyond just the K through 12 schools. I know the Attorney General, which has to approve bylaws for towns as opposed to cities, has approved those types of buffers. So. And, um, and just a question for you, Mr. Clausen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I imagine it'll get to the council for some kind of consideration and vote on however the council will choose to do that. Um, and there might be a public hearing of some sort uh, in front of the council before they vote. Like, who, is there a public meeting before then of the planning board? So th this is our first public meeting um, okay. outside of the moratorium. There will be a public hearing. As, as I mentioned, the joint public hearing is scheduled it's generally scheduled uh, three weeks after it's been um, uh, uh, referred from the city council to the planning board. So these are rough dates, um, but you know we'd be submitting to the city council middle October, so October 15th or 16th, whatever that Monday is. They, they would have on, that, on the agenda the proposed zoning ordinance amendment um, that would be made available to the public. Um, they would then schedule a public hearing jointly with the planning board and that would be, you know, roughly three weeks later under state law, under Mass General Law Chapter 48, any time a zoning change takes place, public notice has to go out two weeks prior to the public hearing. Um, just so pragmatically, uh, you're looking at probably the first meeting in November. So November, I think that's November 5th. Um, so you're looking at, at that time for the public hearing. And that is a very formalized process whereby the public has an opportunity to comment on the, the draft ordinance. And, and then, um, I can't remember the other question I had for you, so you're off the hook. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. If, if, you all right? Yeah. If I could, just to clarify, and Mr. Clausen's talked a, a few times already about the process that's been undergone to date. We've probably had seven or eight different sessions already at the conference table in the mayor's office where we've been digging into this and looking at it and and then there's more work done and then we come back together and so the the you know the framework of what we may put forth to the council is still you know being developed but what you heard tonight is what we're looking at these various buffers and and other ways of, of um, um, try, trying to ensure that where there's a sensitivity to location to needing to buffer from you know from uh, an area that there are you know, there are a lot of kids uh, recognizing that um, if we end up limiting the number of retail establishments to four, we don't want them all in the same block, right? We don't necessarily, we, we, we don't want them all kind of clustered in one place. Uh, we've got to identify legitimate zones where it makes sense uh, and then not overlay with so many buffers that they just can't find a place, an address to go to because that would be effectively zoning out. We can't do that. So it's really about being thoughtful of, of, of determining where it makes sense zoning-wise and then where we must buffer, right? And that's got to that's gotta leave at the end of the process sufficient number of addresses where it could go, where any of these could go. Um, and, and again, you asked about public process. Well, here we are. And the next step, as Mr. Clausen said, will be to file with the council to get all the information about the details of the proposed ordinance out there for you to look at and digest and ask questions about and then go to the council meeting where the public hearing is held. And, and, and I would expect and hope that it'll be a really robust uh, public hearing with a lot, of, a lot of good information shared. Yeah. Hi. Um, as a mother and a grandmother of um, children, and now grandchildren in Beverly, um, and also as a, a citizen who loves her city, um, I'm saddened and disappointed. Um, I voted against the legaliza legalization. I had no idea that um, because it was 54 to, yeah, um, right. that that would mean that our city would have to have the um, marijuana shops. I had no idea. So um, I'm wondering how many other citizens did not realize that. 
And also, um, I was wondering why this meeting tonight was not put on a call out to people uh, so more people could be told about what's happening. We, we notice this everywhere we could publicly notice it. You're asking why we didn't do a reverse 911 call about this meeting. We, we try not to do too many reverse 911 calls you know, in the course of the year, uh, so that when, when they come, people hear them, listen to them, as opposed to just deleting them off their machine. Um, so, you know, we, we put this out uh, through our, you know, typical media outlets as well as across social media and posted publicly. So, you know, we wanted as many people here tonight as we could, and thankfully we have BevCam uh, recording so that people, is this, this isn't live, right? It's recorded. So it'll, it'll be on BevCam. If you've got friends and neighbors who aren't here and you want them to get a sense of where things are at, I'd, I'd encourage them to watch BevCam and, uh, and also encourage them to come to the public hearing when it happens. So, but there's no real voice at the, at the public hearing. It's just informational. No, no, no. Public hearing before the city council is where anybody who wants to testify can sign up, stand up, and express your views. But there has to be a um, kind of a process before that with signatures in order to make a change. Oh, it, the, so we will be presenting a proposed ordinance to zone where these retail establishments can go and the other, and the, other the growing uh, establishments. That's separate and apart from any of your desire to gather signatures and try to put a question on the ballot at a future election. Just have a quick question. Uh, given that this was voted in, uh, you know, positively voted in by the voters, and it's going to happen, have have has there been any kind of estimate or study about the financial benefit to the city based on the three percent tax and the impact um, tax and all that? We, we haven't done that kind of analysis. It's it's hard to say at this point because there are, there aren't facilities in in Massachusetts and the Commonwealth to. To really get a good sense, I know we can look at other states, um, and uh, it, you know, might be worthwhile doing so. But I think every state, in my opinion, every state is a little bit different context in, in terms of the enabling legislation, so licensing. It's difficult to really give you a solid idea of what we could be talking about. Yeah. I just have a, a simple question or basic question. I thought that if there was a law established by the Commonwealth. It, like for the 500 foot buffer zone, we, I thought that the communities could make it more restrictive, but the communities can make it less restrictive than a state law? Yeah, so the, the, the state regulations say that the community can make it less restrictive. Oh, okay. It's silent on whether or not it can make it more restrictive. And as the solicitor pointed out earlier, there have been uh, uh, bylaws, uh, ordinances, zoning ordinances for towns that have been adopted and approved by the Attorney General um, that have added additional buffers on other uses. Like, in, in our sense, we're looking at a library, so a library would be something that's outside of what's regulated um, in the, in the uh, Cannabis Control Commission regulations. Thanks. I'd just like to make one other comment as I'm listening to, to folks voice their opinions around the room. And I know that this is a very emotionally charged topic for, for a lot of folks. Personally, I, I am in favor of it. Um, but I would encourage anyone who's considering you know, the, the signature route to, to get something else uh, you know, on, a, on a ballot to do your homework. Um, to, to the point made by our, our Marine Corps veteran back there, thank you for your service, by the way. There is a lot of there's a lot of misinformation that's circulating out there. Um, there are you know plenty of studies that talk about the the positive elements of this. Certainly, there have been plenty of studies that have shown that marijuana usage is much less detrimental to health in just about every way than alcohol. But I don't hear too many people around the room talking about getting signatures to ban alcohol sales in the city of Beverly. Um, there are no documented cases of marijuana overdosing. Not a single one. Um, so I would encourage you, as you think about how you want to proceed in this area, do your homework, do your research, and don't make decisions based on an emotional knee-jerk reaction.
Any more questions before we wrap up? Since I'm close. Your comment. I'm a nurse. I work in pulmonary. The hazards of marijuana, smoking marijuana, and lung disease is out of control. And every day we have patients that are coming in that smoke marijuana, and they've got to stop because it's lung disease. Hmm? I know, but if they're doing both or they're doing just plain marijuana, then it's a huge problem. So you have to look at that as an issue. So one thing, um, to, to your point, I think it's a, it's a fair point. Um, there is requirements under the Cannabis, Cannabis Control Commission to, uh, for the, the operators to put information out there to, to people who are going to consume, um, whether it's an edible, topical, or smoking in this, in this case that you're talking about the dangers of, of it, which are similar to smoking. And, and Mr. Claussen just kind of subtly said that, but didn't really point out there there are numerous cannabis products that don't require smoking. Right, so, uh, we, oh, please, yep. Uh, just one thing, I, I do have numbers if anybody wants to know uh, how much money the city could make. Please. Um, uh, according to the Colorado Department of Revenue, uh, Denver County in 2014 raked in $76 million in taxes. 2015, 135 million, 216, 2016, 198 million, and 2017, 247 million. And so that's Denver it, so, County. So as they've implemented, it's been growing as they've kind of Absolutely. Moved, moved to full implementation. Do you know what the population is of Den Denver County, just for comparison? It's less than Essex County. Less than Essex, but as we're talking about our one small city. Right, that, that's a, more of a broad scope yeah, as yeah. far as a county I, goes. So I think that the, the point being there's, and, and I know this was, this statistics and the conversation was out prior to the, to the vote two years ago. There was a lot of data put out about the uh, potential economic benefits to municipalities and, 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 and localities with this. So there, if, if you want more information on that, please do uh, touch base. Now we've got, we're going to stop at 830, um, but we now have two more thoughts that want to come our way. Emily. We, these two gentlemen here, and uh, is there anybody else that doesn't want to miss the chance to say something? We got about five more minutes. Okay. I just had a couple of questions, basically on the follow-up to the numbers and that, and the three percent fee and all of that. Well, first, I also wanted to ask: the money raised by the three percent fee and the taxes on the marijuana um, of cannabis usage would that be targeted to a specific fund in the city reserves, or not reserves, on the city budget? And second, we have the 3% limit. Would you be able to, at a later date and time, increase that number depending on how the establishments are doing per year to year? So both of the 3% on the sales tax for retail and on the gross sales for all, right, that would be part of the impact fee, both of those are capped at a high end at 3%. And, and as far as uh, I, I would imagine that the sales tax that comes into the city's general fund, like every other sales tax does, the impact fees are meant to be um, reasonably related to impacts that we would anticipate. Um, um, need for you know, preventative education around, uh, around misuse, um, public health, public safety, things like that, uh, you know, broadly. So it could go to, to help fund any additional resources that might be needed in like the police departments or the school departments to educate children and, and that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. you to, oh, thank you. So I have two more questions. And I'm, I'm not making a judgment on marijuana just or cannabis, but just asking questions. One is, and the city solicitor would probably know this, um, is there a prohibition on the selling of cannabis items via retail markets um, that, for instance, look like gummy bears or something like that? And I have one other question. But. So that is regulated under the CCC regulations. Um, I, I do believe, and I, 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 it's very detailed, I, I think there is a prohibition on um, making the product appear as though it's candy for children. I don't want to, I, I, I don't know the exact details, um, but I know that has been a concern and a consideration, so. 
and I guess one question, and I don't know who to, I think I would ask this of you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, so let's say Beverly has a retail facility and somebody goes to that retail facility to purchase the cannabis. Um, and for some reason at some later time, they become, uh, I don't know, unaware or unable to perform a mechanical function like driving. They get in their car, they drive. We know that's illegal. But is there a way that the city police departments have kind of figured out how to measure if a person's drunk on cannabis for whatever, I don't know what the word is. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Let's get his microphone <laughs> because we're, we're almost at time and, that, and that's, you, you saved the best question for last, thanks. Uh, you know, we, 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 we have all heard and are concerned with the, you know, with the reality that there is a reliable test for inebriation, you know, with, with alcohol and the question is, is there a test for being impaired, uh, you know, under, with, um, for having smoked or used cannabis uh, and then get behind it. I know that that's an ongoing conversation and concern. Uh, I know that police have, uh, have the ability to do field sobriety tests, and I'm, I'm not trying to speak for our team here, but, um, you know, there, there just isn't something that is, um, um, the breathalyzer test is, you know, is, is uh, something measurable, right, as opposed to, uh, an evaluation of somebody's abilities being impaired. So it, it's an ongoing concern as, you know, as we as a state look at the, um, you know, of course there's been medical, medical cannabis, sorry, use now for a few years. So it's an ongoing concern that somebody would get behind the wheel in a condition that they weren't really alert and, and, and capable of, of driving unimpaired. Um, other than that, I'm not going to try to give you an answer that, that we don't know. Um, and we probably, you know, want to look to other jurisdictions and see how they're handling and, and how well it's going in terms of, of trying, to, trying to police people not getting behind the wheel when they shouldn't. Well, I think what I'd like to say is th thank you so very much for spending the last hour and a half together and bringing up so many good points and asking so many thoughtful questions. It's helping us think through as we move forward uh, with the, uh, the need to present um, a proposed zoning ordinance. And I'm sure anybody who then watches this at home will have a better sense of the questions that we're all uh, grappling with as we go forward. So don't hesitate to reach out to me at City Hall, to any of our city councilors, and know, um, you know look for um, a public hearing likely at the first city council meeting in November. Uh, perhaps that night, perhaps at another a night uh, under a special meeting, since our goal is to submit a proposed ordinance at their second October meeting. So we'll, we'll continue the conversation in that setting. Thanks very much again, everybody. Have a good night.